So yesterday we had a busy day. We had the rummage sale. We had a busy week. Thanks to all of you that came and helped, delivered the goods and everything. So we raised a little over $400 for Awana to start out with. And so it was great. <laughs> Appreciate it. We had people who promised to be here this morning. We got their numbers. We know where they live. And hopefully we'll see them again soon. And then this week, we've actually say thank you for the generosity and everything. We've actually been able to help 21 kids so far uh, with backpacks for school. And uh, we still got all the way from Oxford to Hamilton to Middletown and all over. And last week as we finished up the sermon on the miracle of mercy, we're talking about the mercy of God and how that mercy should come through us as a church. And so this morning, what I'd really like to do is take a break between sermon series and really would like to talk to you about the church in general. Because a lot of times people will define the church as a building. They'll say, well, where do you go to church? Well, I go to church over there on 1601 Jackson Lane. It's called Calvary Baptist Church. And they'll say, well, where do you worship? Well, I worship at 1601 Jackson Lane at Calvary Baptist Church. Failing to realize that the church isn't a building. A building is a place where we gather together corporately to worship, to learn, to fellowship, to grow, to minister to one another. But church is also outside the building, more so than inside the building. You're only here for just a little while. And so what we need to understand is that Jesus has told us that wherever two or three are gathered together, he says, in my name, he said, there I'll be in the midst. And that's why you need to understand that church is in your home, where there are two of you, or three of you. Church is in the supermarket. It is in the store when you meet someone, and you're sitting there and you're talking together about the Lord. Do you understand that the Lord is right there in that conversation? If you're at work and there are two of you that are gathered together right there talking about Jesus, do you know that God is right there? He is not confined to a time, a space. He is only confined to where two or, people, two or more of his people are gathered together at any point in time. And that's what we need to understand more than anything else. So this morning, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to read a lot out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it talks about unity as well as diversity in the Bible or in the body of Christ. The first 11 verses deals with spiritual gifts that are given to each and every one of us. I hear people all the time say, well, I don't have a spiritual gift. May I say this to you that, yes, you do. And we're going to talk to you this morning about the missing piece. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse number 12, it says this. For, the body, for as the body is one, it has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body. So also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, let me, let me stop just a moment right here. Just explain something real quick. And that is this. When you were baptized in a baptistry, in a creek, however you were baptized, you were baptized into the church, not into the body of Christ. Okay? The moment that you got saved, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And this is where he says that we were all baptized by one spirit. 
Paul and them, they were, they were, Peter, they were having this discussion because some people thought that, well, my baptism is better because I was baptized by this person or that person or that person. May I, may I say to you that that is not true? I hear people all the time say, well, I, I, I was baptized by Pastor Chuck. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I was glad to participate in that, you know. But the baptism of the Spirit, he did it, not me. And so I've heard people come back and say, well, I need to be rebaptized. And, and, and I'll say, why is that? And they'll say, well, because I was baptized by this preacher and this preacher is no longer preaching. They've walked away from God, so my baptism is no longer any good. No, your baptism in that point, ladies and gentlemen, is not based upon an individual, okay? That's not what it is. Because the baptism is not to the authority of the individual, it is to the authority of the church, okay? Well, what happens if the church goes under? Don't worry about it, you're still baptized. If you want to get baptized again, go for it. God ain't going to fault you for it. Three, four, five times if you want. But please understand what it, baptism is all about. Baptism isn't just because, well, I, I think I want to get wet again. You, you know? Um, you all understand how much I love water, so I've done it twice. I will only do it one more time, and that's somewhere else. Okay? But listen, it says this. He says, you're all baptized into one body, whether you're Jews or Greeks, whether, whether you're slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a, I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. In spite of, of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. In spite of this, it still belongs to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were an ear, where would the sense of smell? But now God has placed the parts, each of them, in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Kind of look funny. Now there are many parts, but yet one body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again to the head, to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, all the more. Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have a better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has placed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles. The gifts of healing, helping, managing, various kinds of languages. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in languages? Do all interpret? He says, but listen, but desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better day. Now, one of the things is I believe that we are all like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. This morning, y'all got a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. So can anybody look at the piece of their jigsaw puzzle right now and tell me what that jigsaw puzzle is? None of us can look at that one piece of that puzzle and tell everybody what that puzzle is, right? So let me tell you what it is. That puzzle actually put all together, 100 pieces of it, is a glow-in-the-dark puzzle of a polar bear on an iceberg. Now, can you get that from your piece? Huh? 
Do you have the bare part? One of the bare parts? But when you begin to start taking the pieces together and putting them together, when you take and you put all hundred pieces of that puzzle together, then you will understand exactly what it is. But let me say this to you. You do not have a complete puzzle if any of those pieces are missing. You may grasp what the great picture is, but you don't get the complete picture of it. Now you'll also notice that there is not one piece of that puzzle that is probably identical to any other piece in that puzzle. Uniquely cut. And some of those pieces, only in the corners, generally of a puzzle, will a corner piece only have two other pieces to go to them. One to the left and one to the right. But when you get into the middle and away from the edges, you will find that some of those pieces may have three pieces that connect to them. Some may have four and some may even have five. They have different. And so when you start taking those five pieces and putting them together, you, do you understand that the piece you have will only fit in one spot of the puzzle? You cannot take your piece and put it over here where it doesn't belong. It's got to be conjoined with the pieces that match right up to it. And you need to understand that this is what Jesus is doing when he's talking about the church. When he talks about Calvary Baptist Church. You all are a jigsaw puzzle. And I have been trying with the help of God to put you all together. <laughs> to understand the complete picture and helping you to understand the complete picture of what it is that God wants you to do in this puzzle. And, you, and when God does this, we need to understand that I need you to keep that piece of that puzzle with you. Don't lose it. Because I want you to pick that piece up and I want you to remember that every time you take a hold of that piece or whenever you look at that piece, that you will remember that you are a part of the piece of this puzzle of this church. And you fit in with others around you to come into the full picture of what the church is about. The church isn't about me. The church isn't about you. The church is about us working together, joining together for the glory of the Father. Amen. And none of us. Every time God allows me to speak to a person, every time that God allows me to share the gospel with someone, you have a part in that. That's why I hope and pray that you're praying for me. Because I'm telling you, I need your prayers more and more every day. Because as I was talking to some people this week and sharing with them, one of the things that you need to understand is this. The closer that a church gets to the point of coming to God and putting God first, the more Satan is going to try to rip it apart and cause division among all of us. And the more that he does that, he'll start wherever he can get into. And whenever we allow him a foothold, what he will do is take that foothold. Because what happens is this. I can't explain to you how many people I meet on a daily basis that walk up and down these streets. Because when you come by here, I am not in the office all the time. And some people say, well, you're doing this and you're doing that. You don't understand who I am. I am not a sit behind the desk type of person. I didn't do it when I worked and I'm not going to do it here. I am a people person that wants to meet people, that want to share with people and talk with people. Because God has blessed me with the gifts that I know that I've got and I'm going to use them. 
You come in here and talk to me and I'll talk to you. People say, well, I don't want to bother you. You don't bother me. That is who I am. You bother me when you don't talk to me. Because if you don't talk to me, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you need praying for. If you don't share, we are the puzzle fitting together. And you need to understand that when you accepted Christ, ladies and gentlemen, you accepted a commitment. And the problem is we don't take that commitment strong enough. We say, well, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But do you understand that the way that the body works is it works through the church? And if you don't become, if you don't think that you're vital to the church, if you just think all I can do is just this or that, you're wrong. You say, well, I'll just share with you and, and just tell you just certain things, okay? Miss Thene is 86 years old. How old? 79, almost 80, okay? I'm making you older than you are. My mom is 86, I'm sorry. Or 87. We'll be 87. She's in there somewhere. I'm just flat out old, okay? But sometimes when you get Miss Thini's age and, and, and her walk is slower than what it used to be, she was sharing with me, one of the things that Miss Thini loves to do is always have a garden. Well, now the garden is too much. And so she can't do the garden anymore. Okay? But she still would love nice tomatoes, cucumbers, half runner beans, um, bell peppers, banana peppers. So if you go buy some, would you bring them to her? If you have a garden, would you share them with her? Okay? But let me share this with you. You've got a group of ladies that are older, but I'll guarantee you they check on each other. They're finding out if everybody's okay. And somebody says, well, pastor, did you know that so-and-so is sick? No, I don't. You know, unless somebody tells me. But most of the time, can I tell you something? Somebody will say, well, aren't you concerned about it? No, because I know somebody's taking care of them. They're part of this ministry and they're vital to this ministry. Miss Thene and I went and saw some, some in the nursing home. And, and, and we got to visit with some people. And they were thrilled. They, they were kind of thrilled to see me, but they were more thrilled to see her. It's not all about me. It's all about him. And understanding that you've got something to do here. And it isn't just occupy space. Because there are people outside these walls that are looking to be loved. They've got issues, they've got problems. I could sit down and this week just met a guy. And he sat there and just shared his story with me. I've never met this guy in my life. But he felt compelled to tell a story of this and this and this and this and this and you're sitting there and he's saying but I need Jesus I grew up in church but I've gone away from church and here's where I'm at in my life and my life's a wreck it's a mess yeah but guess where he's coming he's coming to the people he's coming to the church because he knows that maybe 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 just maybe we're close enough to God, we can point them in the right direction and help them. But if we feel we're not essential, if we feel that we're not valid, if we feel like hey, I don't have anything to do in this church, then what's going to happen is that person's going to walk away from here and not have the need met that God brought them into, the, into our midst for. This is why it's imperative to understand exactly you know, what, he's, what, he's, what he's talking about. And you need to understand do you understand what Jesus gave us life for? I hear people all the time say, well, he gave us life for me. He gave us life for you. No, 
Yes, he gave his life to save us, but he gave his life for his bride. You know who his bride is? The church. He didn't say that I gave my life for this one individual. If that's the only person that got saved, yes, that's all he would do. But he knew, God knows, there's going to be more than one person saved. So we're all going to make up the bride of Christ. When that song says that at the midnight cry, when Jesus says, son, go get your children, then the bride of Christ shall rise. The bride of Christ is the church of God made up by individuals. But you know what it is? It's an ear. It's a nose. It's a toe. It's a big finger. It's a fingernail. It's a hair. Everyone is vital to make it up because if, if, somebody is the eye and they're not working, that church is only going to see one direction. And the church will be one-sided, going in one direction, and never able to see what's on the external. Do you ever go into the doctor and you, he's doing an eye exam and he says, okay, here's what I want you to do. Tell me when you see the little blinking light to the right. And you know there's supposed to be a little blinking light to the right and you keep looking and you keep looking and you can't find it. You know what that feels like? God, there's something going wrong with my eyes. God, I used to be able to see what was over here. God, I used to be able to see what was over here. But I can't see that anymore, God. Because I'm losing part of my eyesight. That's what's happening in the church. The church is losing part of its eyesight because the people that should be seeing the peripheral vision, they're, they're all becoming blinded and one-sided. Because, because what happens is Satan wants you to be one-sided. He doesn't want you to get into fellowship or bringing people into the Lord. He doesn't want you to go out here and minister to people. To, to disciple people and help them to grow. He doesn't want your worship to be worship. He wants your worship to be one-sided and self-centered and self-righteous. And I'm the singer. I'm the singer. Listen to my great voice. Some of the greatest singers with the great voices are the worst worshipers in the, in the world. Because it's all about them and not about God. The music is great. The songs are great. But the heart is not there. And that's why I keep saying to you, it doesn't matter how well you can sing. It's how well your heart is. And what are you putting into it? Because let me share this with you. This church will only be as good as what you put into it. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, I pour my heart into this place. Because I want it to be the best, not the worst. I want it to be a place where people that are sick can come here and get healed. I want it when people have issues and have, people have problems, they know that they can come here and we can, reach, we can reach the ears of God and that they can get answered. And if you don't think that it can happen, you weren't with me out on the middle of a, of a creek or a lake on Friday night knowing how much I am afraid of water and sitting there in a boat with no anchor and just drifting. Having no idea where it was going to go and where it was going to land. And sitting in that thing for almost an hour and a half. Did I get over my fear of water? Absolutely. But was I jumping in it? No. God helped me get over the fear of water but he didn't tell me to be an idiot. But can I tell you, everybody kept looking at me, and I don't know what I looked like, but I thought I looked okay. But everybody kept asking me, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. You want to switch seats? No, this seat is good. It's attached to me right now. <laughs> and Diana says, but there's these bugs that are hitting me. And I said, okay, hon, you go ahead and sit behind the windshield. I'll sit, I'll sit back there. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But if that had happened to me about four or five years ago, that boat probably would have sunk. Because four or five years ago, I tell you what, I would have had an anxiety attack. 
I probably would not have been here. I would have probably took me and everybody else. That's why if you are on a boat with me and I fall over, let me go. Don't try to save me because you're going to go down with me. I will take you down. But God's blessed me and I don't have to do that. But let me share with you a story to go along with the sermon this morning. Because I found it and in, in it's kind of really inappropriate or appropriate. The story goes like this. He says, I heard about a high school that had a career day for seniors. To kick off the meeting, they assembled all the students in the gym and all the recruiters, one by one, stood and explained how great it would be to come and work for them. After the presentation, the students would stop by booths and fill out applications or hand in a resume. Included in the program were Armed Forces representatives. The Navy recruiter spoke on the advantages of a career with this organization. And he encouraged the students telling them that they had, that they had what it took to make it in the Navy. Well, after his presentation, a tough, muscular-looking Marine stood at the podium. He looked around at the crowd of students and he shook his head. And here's what he said. I don't see anyone here who can make it in our program. It's the toughest challenge that you'll ever face. I don't think any of you have the guts to become a Marine. If you think you've got what it takes, come and see me after the presentation. And here's the rest of the story. After the assembly was over, guess which booth had the largest number of inquiries? The Marines. They were flooded with applicants. You see, here's what happens in a lot of churches. And don't get me wrong, but this is the wrong way to look for a church. They want us to stand up and be recruiters and tell them what we have to offer to them. And then they will decide whether they want to join this church or not. That is absolutely wrong. You should never look for a church for what that church has to offer to you. You should always look for a church where God says, here's what you've got to offer to them. Here is the piece of the puzzle that was missing that you need to be in, fit in to do the work that is needed. Because I can tell you, there is plenty of work to do around here for anybody. A lot. You may say, I do not have any talents. Oh, yes, you do. And God's been preparing you for these moments of doing these things. We need to understand that this is something that I have not stressed and I apologize to you. Because as I've been able to spend more time here and more time praying and more time just studying and more time of this and self-evaluations and looking and seeing what are you doing wrong? One of the things that I have done wrong that I need to stop now and start over and that is this. You need to understand that membership in this church should be held in highest of esteem. This isn't just a building. This isn't just a place that we worship. Membership in church is very, very important. Because it allows us, and here's why. I've shared this many times. You can go to your neighbor's house and sit at their table and eat all day long. And you can eat every, every meal with them. That does not make you a part of their family. When you come into this church and membership in this church and understanding what this is, this makes you a part of this family. 
and, and, and for those of you that aren't, don't get me wrong. I appreciate you all and all the stuff that y'all do. But there's vital pieces that are missing here that you hold. And this is why God has sent you here. It's saying they need this. Because why? Every one of you are important to this church. And you may say, well, they'll never miss me when I'm not here. Yes, we do. We do. Because when you're not here, the prayers that you could offer for the souls that are sitting in this congregation are missing. Do you know, when you've got 100 people pulling on a rope, it's easier to overtake 20 people. But if you've only got 20 people pulling on that rope against 20 people, sometimes it becomes a standstill. And I don't know about you, but the enemy, ladies and gentlemen, is working overtime and causing the church to be standstills. I've been talking to people left and right who have grew up in church, went to church all their life, and are no longer going to churches because they've been hurt, because they got this, they got that. I'm going to tell you all something, and I'll be honest and upfront with you. If you stay here at any period, point in time, I am going to hurt your feelings. I'm honest with you. I will hurt your feelings. Intentionally, no. Unintentionally, yeah. I may say something that you don't like. I may look at you when I'm saying something in the message, and you may say, well, he preached right at me, and, and, and I am so t sick and tired of him doing that every time, that every time he's got this point to say, he always points in my direction. I am a directional person. I am not one of these that, that just likes to read and look down. I like to see your faces. I like to see the deer in the headlight looks. <laughs> because, you want to know why? Because when I see that deer in the headlight look, it's like, did he just say that? Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. I get your attention. You know, when that deer is standing in front of that car, you got his attention. He's got to do something. Either move or get run over. So if I get your deer in the headlight look, what I'm getting is you either got to move or you're going to get run over. But when God says, listen, you need to understand something. If even one piece is missing, it's not complete. There are times that we don't understand the whole picture. And in order to understand the whole picture, you got to get involved. And you got to be part of it. Because there are some times that you'll say, why in the world did he do that? Get involved. You'll understand why I do what I do. Hang around me long enough, you'll understand why I am the way I am. I've not always been a person that's been personable. I've always not been a person that's easy to talk to. I've, always, I've not always been a person that really cared. But God has sure changed an awful lot from where I was to where I am and where I'm headed. But can I tell you something? Let me ask you this question. If you were forgiven for 99.9% 99 .9 of your sins, where would you go? Huh? You'd be lost. If you were forgiven for 99.99999% of your sins, you're still lost. You got to be forgiven of all of them. Do you know what God does when he saves us? He forgives us of the penalty of all of our sins. Not the consequences, the penalty. What am I going to heaven for? Not for the consequences of my sin. My body will pay the consequences of my sin. My soul will reap 
the consequences of the forgiveness, which is eternal life. So, if you only use part of your brain, you got issues. One day a pastor went to visit a member of his church, and one that had been, he had not been to the church services in several weeks. He said, the man was, was pleased to receive the visit, and they sat having a, a hot cup of cocoa in front of this blazing fireplace. The man, the pastor asked the man, he said, are you okay? And the man said, yeah, everything's fine. When he asked him why he missed so many services, the man said, Reverend, I've been studying the Bible every day. Bible. Each and every day I've been praying in a very consistent manner. I have kept close to the Lord. Why would I need to go to the church building to study the Word and praise Him? I can do that here at home. As he was talking, a piece of the burning wood fell from the, fell from the fire, rolling over to, to, the, to the side. It turned a black, a dark black coal, a color as the man spoke. And the pastor said, smiling, or he said nothing. He just got up used the tongs to pick up the black piece of wood and placed it back in the middle of the fire. It instantly began to burn, ever so bright. The man became one of the most active men in the church. And maybe that's what you need to understand, that you have become a log that's out of the fire. A log out of the fire, ladies and gentlemen, will lose its heat. And what you need to understand, and, and, I, and I hear this all the time, you do not have to come to church. I don't have to come to church to study the, my word. I do not have to come to church to pray. I do not have to come to church to worship. Can I tell y'all something? You need to talk to Jesus. Tell Jesus he didn't have to go to church or to the synagogue. Tell Jesus he didn't have to pray. Let me say this to you. The most prayingest person that I've ever, ever read of, ever met, was a guy by the name of Jesus. The person that probably talked most to the Father was Jesus. The person who studied the Bible more than anybody else has ever studied it and knows all the answers is Jesus. But can I tell you where Jesus was on the Sabbath day? Out in a cornfield eating corn. No. He was in the sanctuary. He was in a synagogue. He was praying. The Bible says, as was his custom. I could tell you exactly where I was going to find Jesus. And you know what? He was going to church even though he knew they were out to get him and try to kill him. He was going into the church and into the synagogue and sitting right in the middle of the synagogue opening up the scrolls and preaching from the Word of God and teaching from the Word of God and, and knowing that they could have at any point in time come in there and gotten him, taken him out and killed him. But he was still right there. Sometimes we need to look closely at the peace. And as I shared with you earlier, let me share with you again. Take that piece of puzzle that you've got and hold it in front of you right now, would you? Look at the piece next to your neighbor and how different it is. Does it fit? Does it join? You notice that it's got either two or three or four pieces that join to it. Do you understand that not every one of those pieces of that puzzle is an eye? And not every one of the pieces of that puzzle is an ear or a toe or a finger or a hand or a leg or a foot? Every, you got the foot? You got what? Oh, okay. You got three paws or toes? Okay. But do you understand that each and every one of us have different fingerprints? Each and every one of us have different DNA? Even though Rick is my brother, we have certain things in common, but there are still other things that are uncommon. He's taller than I am. 
He's a bigger target than I am. <laughs> and then we'll stop there. We'll leave it. But each of you are holding a piece of this puzzle that will only complete this picture. And so my question to you is this. If you were to throw away that piece of that puzzle on your way out of this church, and next Sunday, when you came back, I would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your piece of the puzzle and we're going to take and bring it up here to the front and put it on, on the communion table. And we're going to interlock all of those pieces and let's see what that picture looks like. And if you took your piece of your puzzle and you didn't come back, if you took your piece of your puzzle and you threw it away, then let me say this to you. The picture will never be complete because it's going to be missing that piece of that puzzle. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the missing piece to this equation. You are the missing piece to what God wants this church to look like and to be. God brought this place together for a reason. And the reason that I'm saying this is, is this. I fear And I'm afraid that churches like this in a matter of about 10 years are going to be non-existent. And they're going to have to fall by the wayside. Many already are. A lot of the churches that grew, that were very small churches that were 10, 15, and 20 members, they're closing the doors. They don't have the people there to support. And here's part of the reason why. And this is, this is one of the struggles that I fought when I, when I came to this church. People would start showing up and, and, and Debbie was here and so you can validate what I'm saying is true. People would come and they would walk in the door and they would have kids, or they would have youth. And they would say, what do you have to offer to our kids? What do you have to offer to our youth? We don't have anything. Because we don't have any youth, and we don't have any kids. And you know what they would do? They'd walk right back out the door and not come back in. Because you want to know why? They didn't want to work in the church. They wanted the church to do the work for them, for their kids. They were searching for a church that had youth so I could get my kids plugged into it. And the problem was, okay, they didn't have youth. So why don't, if I've got five kids, why don't I start youth? Why don't I start children? But none of them would do that until finally some started and, 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 and more began to invite friends and families started coming. And this is where we're at today. When I came here 10 years ago next July, we were, the, we were the youth. Mark, Debbie, me, and a couple other people who were all born in the year 1954. Except I brought along someone else, my wife, who was younger than us. But you look around today and what do you see? You see a diversity in the church. We are different ages, we are different backgrounds. We have different things to offer. We're not all the same clone. The piece of the puzzle that you have is very unique to operate from. God is blessing us right now to be able to reach out to more and more and more. And the more we reach out to people, the more issues we're getting. And you know what? Praise the Lord. So what? We all, we all got issues. And if you say you don't have any, I'll give you some of mine. Okay? Just say, okay, I'll sit down and listen to you, Pastor Chuck. You tell me all your issues and all your problems. 
and I'll ask you, how many months do you have? <laughs> because we're all issues. We're all problems. Every one of us have something that we're dealing with. And every one of us needs somebody else to help us deal with that issue and that problem. You can't fix your problems. You can become a great listener and maybe, maybe, just maybe, God will give you some words of wisdom to help an individual. And that's what you're here for. We're here as toes and fingers, eyes and ears, nose, and everything else about us to work together, to join together, to make this picture work. Because I don't know about you, I want this place to be around in 10 years. I want people to know what this place stands for and who it is. Because it stood for the Word of God and is standing for the Word of God and will continue. But the only way it does that is if we work together. So, the bulletin was a missing piece. My question to you this morning is, are you ready to man up or woman up and say, yes, Lord, I will take my commitment to this church, not just occasionally, I will take it to heart. And God, you died for me. You sacrificed for me. And God, I am going to sacrifice for you in this family. And when you do, ladies and gentlemen, watch out. Watch out. Because this place will explode. And I'm, just, I'm not talking about in numbers. They may not even come here. But you're going to be running into people in the streets. You're going to be running into people everywhere you go that's going to be wanting to know what is so different about you than what's different about me. You've got something that I don't have, and I need to know what it is that you've got. And can you share with me what that is? And I'll tell you exactly how to share it. Just tell them. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And he'll open the doors. This morning, let's stand together. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at pastorchuck at calvarybaptistmiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would, please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 930 with our morning worship following at 1045. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting. They're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at 7. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up. Just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.